Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to offer you the warmth of this wonderful sanctuary to come in out of the cold and dreary days. But what is it that they always say? Uh, April showers bring May flowers. And it's now time for the passing of the peace. Good morning, before we get to the passing of the peace. That's okay. Hang on a second, folks. Wait, wait, wait. They follow directions really well. Good morning, everybody. I have a few announcements and things I wanted to talk about before we got to the passing of the peace and into service this morning. Uh, first, welcome to everybody and to all those who are watching online. A um, few announcements in the bulletin. We have Finance and Administrative Council meeting coming up on Tuesday night, so please um, be aware of that if you're on either one of those. Uh, the Woman Group's rummage sale is coming up, and it says we've been collecting stuff, but is anybody here who's leading the rummage sale this morning? Because I've had a bunch of people ask me, when's the building going to be open so people can drop things off, and I don't know what to tell them. Evenings? Okay, but you don't open up, you don't have other hours when it's just open for collection. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, also notice that the crop walk is getting closer. Um, you're invited to sign up for that. Sue is usually in the refreshment area after church. So if you're interested in either walking or in supporting someone who is, um, please see her at that table. And the last piece was the ladies' banquet at Faith that everyone's been invited to. I know that Martha was going to mention at the ladies' meeting last Monday. Um, but anybody who wasn't there and is interested, um, I suppose get in touch with her and let her know. Um, she has the list of whoever she talked to that night. The last thing for today is you'll find a special envelope in your bulletins this morning. You may know the United Methodist Church has six weeks during the year when it asks for special offerings to support special types of ministry. This week is Native American ministers. Um, and so the service today will have some pieces to it that come from Native American communities that worship um, that I've tried to incorporate today. And if anybody's interested in learning more about what this Sunday is about, the collection. The second page inside your bulletin has a page-long thing that talks about what goes on with it. Um, I, it's an important one to me. I worked on the Committee for Native American Ministries here in Upper New York for a number of years. And even though I had worked with folks in Native communities before I became a pastor, that gave me a whole different insight into what we do. Um, most people don't know that there are actually 10 reservations in New York State uh, between the Iroquois and the Algonquians, folks down on Long Island, that at one point, last time I checked, New York, I think, was ranked 10th as far as the number of Native Americans in any state. We don't usually think of that for New York, but it is a huge community here. Um, and the funds that are collected, half of them stay here in the conference to support the ministry of the three Native American churches we have and other folks who are in ministry with them. Um, there's actually a grant program that churches can apply to if they're doing something with a Native community. Um, but we have four corners on Cattaraugus territory, Hogansburg, which is up in St. Regis or Aquasasne area, and the Onondaga Nation has a Methodist church. 50% uh, of everything collected today will go to those 25% goes to a fund to help get Native American Christian leaders to go to seminary, because many of them can't afford it on their own, and then they can lead their own communities. And 25% goes to other bigger projects throughout the UMC. Um, all kinds of things, details are there for you. I did want to point out too some pieces that are on the altar today are things I've picked up through my work with Native American folks. There's a feather, a turkey feather fan, a Lakota drum from the 19th century. Um, there's some sage in a shell, but I'm not going to burn the sage because I've found that folks have 
problems with breathing if they have asthma or other difficulties. Um, I have a Navajo weaving that I wear as a stole today and a piece of beadwork done by Cherokees. This was a gifted to me when I was ordained by the groups I was working with. So this is a, a ministry that's close to my heart even if I'm not doing it actively today. With that stuff out of the way, let us take time to greet our neighbors and share the peace of Christ with each other. May the peace of Christ be with each of you as we gather for worship this morning. For a call to worship this morning and an opening prayer, you'll find in the insert to your bulletins what's called the directional prayer. I picked this up from a woman who's a Kiowa who I was working with, and um, she allows us to continue to use it. So I'd ask you to rise as you're able, and if you feel so moved, to join me in facing the directions as we go through this. Facing east, in this place where the sun rises, the light, life, and love of your creation washes over us. Here you remind us that each day brings new beginnings. As we turn to face south, the warm wind welcomes us to a place of beauty and trust. Here we pause to remember those who have come before, persons known and unknown, who have enriched our lives. For those who now walk with us on this life's journey, wherever they are now, we hold them in our hearts. We are grateful for your presence through the faces of the saints. We faced west where the sun sets. The glow of light transforms into darkness. This is a place of introspection and rebirth. Here, your presence reminds us to sort through what will die, what is left behind, and what we will carry forward. As we face north, the cool breeze beckons us. It is here where we claim the wisdom of our years, the learnings of this journey. We recognize the impact of our works and our words on future generations. We encounter you as we cooperate with one another to make your vision for our world. We look up to the sky. It is here we encounter your abundance beyond our understanding. We remember Jesus lifting the five loaves and two fish to heaven to bless them, and he fed 5,000 with more to spare. We look up and behold your infinity, your immensity, we look to the earth, and here we are on holy ground. In Mother Earth, we experience your love, generosity, and strength over and over. You have provided all we need, food and water to sustain, medicine to heal. We are surrounded in beauty. As we look to each other, we are grateful for our communion with one another, 
and with our brothers and sisters of the water, the air, and the land. We are visitors here, not owners. Mother Earth is our grandchildren's inheritance. May we learn to walk lightly, lovingly on Mother Earth, taking only what we need. We return to the center of the circle, acknowledging all you have done and will do, and all you have given. We are grateful. God, we are now ready to receive the Holy Spirit in this place and upon this gathering. Be with us in worship, fellowship, classrooms, in our going out and our coming in. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to join in our opening hymn, number 378, Amazing Grace. And you may notice at the bottom of the page, there are five different languages, Native American languages, in our hymnal for this. like to invite our young disciples to come forward.
talking about a story that you just told, right? A parable. What's a parable? No, what's a parable? What's a parable with fancy word for? It? A little story. A little story. Jesus liked to tell little stories because that was a good way to teach us. You know, we listen to those stories and he, you know, he think them over, make us think. He knew those things. Um, so last week, I know what you talked about. <laughs> you talked about a story that Jesus told called the parable of the talents. Now there was this farmer. Was he a farmer? He was going away. Ring a bell? Anybody? Yes. Yes. He was going away. And what did he get? Three people who worked for him, right? And what did he do with these three people? He gave them money. Did he give them all the same money? No. 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 So, Chase, do you remember anything about him with the money? No. Was Chase here with us? No. Oh, he wasn't here? Well, no wonder. No wonder. Um, the Teddy. The Teddy's going to see me. Um, so, did he give them all the same money? No, no. He gave one person, say, five coins, the next guy three, and the next guy one. And he said, listen, I'm going away. I'm giving you, and, 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 and in a funny way, not a funny way, but an ironic way, maybe, because these coins were called talents. So, we think of talents as maybe something else, but it kind of fits all together. So he says to them, here's this money. I'm going away. You guys take good care of it. Use it to, to do what I would do if I wasn't here. And he goes away. And so the first guy has five coins. He works hard. He invested. He buys stuff, whatever. He ends up turning it into three times. So five to 15. The second guy has three. What does that guy do? I'm going to rely on you to tell me what the guy with one did, okay? So the guy with three also works, best, whatever, works hard, and he gets, yes? I do it. You know? Hang on one minute, I'm going to ask you a very important question. So this guy takes his three, and he makes a lot more, and I think he triples it as well. So he's got nine. The guy with one, what did he do? Ever, do you know what the guy with one did with it? What did he do with it? dug a ditch, he buried it, and he hid it, right? He hid that one, and he hid that one because he was afraid. He was afraid if he did something with it, he'd lose it, and that his master would be angry with him. So Jesus told this story, and Jesus was really the farmer, if you think about it. The farmer's God. That's what Jesus wants you to think about. That farmer's God. And he gives us all talents. You got any talents in this crew? Chase, you got any talents? Baseball. Baseball. This is a great example. Baseball. Chase is a really good baseball player. How about you? Baseball. You play baseball too? Anybody else got any talents? <coughs> I know Teddy's really good artist. That I know. Yeah. You too? Yeah. Okay. Somebody's watching. <laughs> uh, yes, Ryan? Uh, soccer. Soccer. Yeah, so those are talents. And I, those, I, I, and those are talent, talents that God, yes, ever. 
they enjoy it. They stop at this baseball game and they have a good time. They feel good. You aren't just using your talent. Before the service, Pastor Doug brought up this book. It's a very beautiful book, Voices of the People. It's all about our Native American Indians. And uh, he wanted me to read a poem by Joseph Brukak about Sitting Bull. Uh, Sitting Bull's Papa Lakota uh, Sioux name was Tatanka Leotaka, and Joseph Brokak was an Indian also. And it has in here uh, all sorts of Indians. Maria Tallchief, the famous ballerina, was an Osage Indian. And uh, Katari Takakawitha was uh, Saint Katari Takakawitha. And the, the founder, Haudenosaunee, of the Iroquois Confederacy. Do you know that the Iroquois Confederacy was a uh, example of the United States government? Benjamin Franklin came here and talked to the Indians about the Confederacy. So part of that, part of the United States government, the good part, is, is based on uh, the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, Sitting Bull lived in, lived from 1831 to 1890. He was one of the three main chiefs that was at the Little Bighorn when General Custer came over the hill and thought that his regiment could take on, as it, as it, uh, he realized there were 10,000 Indians. And this time, the cowboys and the Indians the Cowboys didn't win, the Indians won big time. So I'm going to read this poem. Many think of him as a warrior. They remember him because he was one of those who stood against and defended Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But to his people, he was something else, a leader who knew medicine and always tried to heal the wounds inflicted on him. And he was a medicine man. His name meant that, like the buffalo, he always faced into the storm and could not be turned around. When he traveled east with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, a newspaper reporter asked him why he was so respected and loved by his people. He replied by asking this question. Is it not true that among your people a man is respected if he owns many things? The reporter agreed that it was true. Then Sitting Bull responded, my people respect and honor me because I keep nothing for myself. Let us all put our minds together and think what we can do for the children. 
That is one of the things Sitting Bull said, and his deeds were always a match for his words. While the Wild West show was in New York City, he saw many white children living homeless and hungry, living on the streets with no one to care for them. So whenever he was paid, he would walk the streets, giving away his money to those children. It's a, a real honor for me to be able to read this poem. I'm going to leave this uh, book that Doug gave me up here. It's called Voice of the People, and it has in here uh, little known facts about little known facts about many Indians. So I thank you. And now, the first Peter, the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke his father, the one who judges all people impartially, according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were transformed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Doug. Today I'm going to read the gospel lesson. Um, and I'm going to read it from, you know, we have the New Revised Standard we often read, or the King James Version. Well, there's been a new translation that's come out recently. It's called the First Nations Version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. This is important because one of the things that Paul noticed early on when he went into new places to speak to the people, if he didn't speak to them in ways that they understood, it was harder for them to connect and to learn the story of Christ. But if he focused what he would teach them through the culture that they already knew, it gave them an end. It let them start learning it more rapidly. And that's what this translation is. It puts things in language that is more familiar to Native communities, um, especially to those that still do not interact as much as most folks do. And so there are some things that are different in it, and I'll, I'll identify those as we go. But to start with, for us, this would be Luke chapter 24. But for them, Luke is considered shining light who tells the good story. On the road to warm springs, this is entitled. On the same day, Two followers of Creator Sets Free, that's Jesus, were walking to the village of Warm Springs, which we know as Emmaus. Seven miles out from the village of Peace, Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about all that happened. Creator Sets Free came alongside them as they walked, but their eyes were kept from seeing who he was. He said to them, what are you talking about? They stopped walking and a look of sadness fell over their faces. One of the men, honored by his father, or Cleopas, answered, how can you not know about the things that have happened in the village of peace? You must be coming from far away. What things are you talking about, he asked. 
about Creator Sets Free from Seed Planter Village or Nazareth. He was a prophet from the Great Spirit with powerful medicine who did many good things among the people. The head holy men and other leaders handed him over to the people of iron, the Romans, to be put to death on a cross. We had hoped that he would free the tribes of wrestles with Creator. And that's actually Israel as we learn it from Scripture. That's what it means. To free them from the people of iron. It is now the third day since they killed him on a cross. But today, some women told us an amazing story. Early this morning, they went to his burial cave and found that his body was not there. They told us about visions of spirit messengers who told them he was alive. Some of our men went to see with their own eyes and found the empty cave, but they did not see Creator sets free. Why are your hearts so slow to believe the words of the prophets, he said to them. It should be clear to you that the Chosen One would suffer first before he would be lifted up and honored above all. So Creator Sets Free told them his story, beginning with Drawn from Water, Moses, and all the prophets. He showed them how all the ancient sacred teachings were written about the Chosen One and pointed the way to him. They still did not know it was Creator Sets Free talking to them. As they entered the village, he walked on as if to go further, and they said to him, Please stay with us. It is late, and the sun will soon set. So he went into the lodging house with them. When they sat down to eat a meal together, Creator Sets Free took some fry bread into his hands. He gave thanks, and he broke it, giving them each a piece. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they knew who he was, but he vanished right in front of them. The men looked at each other in wide-eyed wonder and said, it felt like our hearts were on fire when he was talking with us on the road, showing us the meaning of the sacred teachings. They got up without finishing their meal and walked back to Village of Peace as fast as they could, for the sun was setting. They found where the eleven had gathered together with others. They were saying, our wisdom keeper is alive. He has shown himself to one who hears, Simon. So the two men told them of what had happened on the road and how their eyes were opened when Creator sets free, broke the fry bread into pieces. We give thanks for these words that tell us the story of Jesus. Amen. And so now I invite you to join in our next hymn, number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
that you found that reading of the gospel at least interesting and that it made sense that you understood the story of the walk to Emmaus. And that walk is seen by many as one of the most significant of all the gospel stories. It leads us as Christians to consider some important questions. One being, where have we seen God? A second being, do we see evidence of Christ or God reflected in the faces of those around us? And if we do, which faces and which situations? And perhaps the most important thing it might challenge us to think about is, can others see Christ in us as we walk through life? Now to help us consider those questions, I'm going to read for you a selection from Shane Claiborne's book, The Irresistible Revolution. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Shane or know of his work. He's a a young, not so young anymore, pastor um, from, I think he's from Tennessee originally. Um, My first image of him, first picture, dreadlocks down to his butt. And uh, he wears clothes that he makes himself. He has a very different take on things. He actually set up an intentional community in Philadelphia where they took some old um, burned out drug houses and turned them into a ministry and reached so many people that way. But this is all written when he first started out, when he was still in seminary. So the background is that he's a young seminary student, already committed to a life in ministry, and thinks he knows where he's going. And one year, him and a a friend decide over the summer, let's do something really important. Let's go to Calcutta and work with Mother Teresa. And so he starts looking around, and he gets a number a phone number, and they tell him, if you call this number, it'll be the the place where she works out of. And so he does it. He calls, actually on a payphone, I think he said it was. And he's amazed that there's this tiny little voice on the other end of the phone. And he says, I'm I'm calling to try and get to Mother Teresa's organization. She says, yeah, that's me. So Mother Teresa answers her own phone. Um, But he asks her, matter-of-factly, he's like, Okay, so I want to come and help. What should I do? She says, get yourself here, and we'll put you to work. On his arrival, he was surprised to find out that there was no hierarchy of worker, no organization with Mother Teresa at top, and certain things that other people did when you first got there. Everybody was expected to do the same thing, even the mother herself. So he soon found found himself working with that population, which this is a colony of lepers, and learning a great deal, much more than he ever thought. He thought he was going to help people. The bottom line is he learned so much himself. So here's, here's the passage with a couple pe- big chunks left out. I fell in love with the home for the destitute and dying and spent most days there. I helped folks eat, I massaged muscles, I gave baths, and basically tried to spoil people who really deserved it. Each day, folks would die, and each day we would go out into the streets and bring in new people. The goal was not to keep people alive. We had very few supplies for doing that. But instead, to allow people to die with dignity, with someone loving them, singing and laughing so that they were not alone. Sometimes folks with medical training would come, and they were overwhelmed with frustration because we had so few medical supplies. And the sisters would hastily explain that our mission was not to prolong life, but to help people die well. While the temptation to do great things is always before us, In Caligat, which is the name of this place, I learned the discipline of doing small things with great deliberation. Mother Teresa used to say, we have, we cannot do great things, just small things with great love. It is not how much you do, but how much love you put into doing it. 
And just as we would be reprimanded for using too much soap when washing dishes, actually we would mix ashes with the soap to make it last longer. I also heard many a volunteer scolded for not putting enough gravy on the rice since the plate was being served to Jesus himself. Calagat is one of the places that showed me resurrection, that life is more powerful than death, that light can pierce darkness. The dying people were some of the most vibrant people I had ever met. There is a morgue in the home for the dying, and as you walk in, a sign on the wall reads, I am on my way to heaven. And when you turn around to walk out, there's another sign you see that says, thanks for helping me get there. As I looked into the eyes of the dying, I felt like I was meeting God. It was as if I were entering the holy of holies of the temple, sacred, mystical. I felt like I should take off my shoes. I knew what Dorothy Day meant when she said, the true atheist is the one who denies God's image in the least of these. The reality that God's spirit dwells in each of us began to sink in. When Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, he meant it. Over and over, the dying and the lepers would whisper the mystical word namaste in my ear. We really don't have a word like it in English, or even much of a Western conception of it. But they explained to me that namaste means, I honor the Holy One that lives in you. I knew I could see God in their eyes. Was it possible that I was becoming a Christian now? That in my eyes they could catch a glimpse of the image of my lover, Jesus. Now, this passage might be a little bit long to read to you, um, even with the skipping the sections I took out. But it holds so much that I want to share with you. I find this to be a wonderful story of discovery, of recognizing that Jesus is in each of us, if only we take the time to stop and look. Much like Cleopas and his friend on that road to Emmaus, though, we are often too preoccupied with the disappointments of life to take the time to see Christ in those around us. Claiborne found Christ in the most unlikely of places, among a dying and destitute people. He was already a seminarian at the time, thought he knew what it was all about, but he really found Christ in those people, in large part by offering simple hospitality. The travelers to Emmaus were so busy talking about the previous week, the trial, the crucifixion, the missing body, that they were missing the big point altogether. And even as Jesus appeared to them, their eyes were closed to his presence. It could be because they were in such deep mourning about what had happened, that they were unable to see what was happening to them at that moment. The power of the resurrection and the birth of a new understanding of Christ right in front of them, and they couldn't see it. The travelers were suffering in much the same way that we often do, so worried about what has happened in the past, what we need to do today, that they were unable to see who their traveling companion was, or to even hear his voice and recognize it and know that Christ was right there with them. They were unable to recognize the message he was telling them clearly, even as he taught it to them again. The pain and the mourning over the past were getting in their way of a new life that was being offered to them at that moment. And yet, There he is, walking with them, talking with them, continuing to teach all that the scriptures foretold must and would happen. 
and still they were unable to make the connection and see that it was him. They were like Mary on that day when she went to the empty tomb, so preoccupied with the mourning that they were not open to the possibilities of great joy that resurrection actually promised. Eventually, the travelers find themselves listening and beginning to hear. Their hearts are being warmed a little at a time, and as the stranger speaks to them, they are intrigued and want to hear more. But still, they do not see who it is in front of them. And then when the stranger makes the part ways and travel on without them, they finally begin to act as Jesus had taught them. They invite the stranger to stay and share a meal. And with that small act of hospitality, the story begins to change. As they sit down to the meal, the stranger does something so familiar to them. He takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and shares it with them. And suddenly their eyes are open. Suddenly they recognize who this is. In that small act of hospitality, they had reopened the doorway to God's grace that Jesus had taught them about. And we're probably all familiar with Matthew 25 and the story of the sheep and the goats where Jesus teaches them, whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. That's what Claiborne found in India and the travelers to Emmaus found. When they offered acts of hospitality, they learned so much themselves. In allowing ourselves to be vulnerable enough to share what we have with others, and especially in being hospitable to strangers, that's where we can see and reflect Christ in our world. That kind of hospitality is not always easy. Reaching out to strangers can certainly be risky. We don't know them, and we often worry about trusting those we do not know. We worry about allowing ourselves to be hurt, and much as Cleopas and his companion were hurting that day, struggling. But it's also through taking that risk, through opening our hearts to strangers, that we can see Christ reflected in them. I'll share with you, uh, Mary told me this before the service, and I didn't get it into the announcements. Fifty-five lunches or breakfasts were served yesterday. That's a perfect example of offering hospitality, and I've seen it some days. These folks come in, and they're old friends now. But one day, they were simply strangers on the street. Through acts like that, our hearts open and connections are made. When we take the risk of being hospitable to others, even those outside our community, we are following the lead that Christ set and the way that he so often reached out to others. The story of the walk to Emmaus reminds us that we need to be ready to see Christ wherever we may be at any time. Each person that enters our lives provides the opportunity to take the risk of hospitality and to reap the reward of seeing the holiness of Christ, seeing God in each other. For the travelers to Emmaus, the recognition of Christ came in the breaking of bread, the sharing of a meal. And with that meal, it wasn't only their bodies, but their souls that were fed and their eyes opened. So I invite each of us, as we leave here this morning and go out into the world, to look for the holy in each other. To be open to seeing Christ walking along with us each day. To actively seek God in our world with each meal we enjoy, with each stranger we encounter, and to be sure that Christ is in each of us for others to see as we walk with them. May God be with each of us every step of our travels through life, and may we be ready to see Christ in each person we encounter and understand. Namaste. To grow holy in me greets the holy in you. Amen.
How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor God with praise. How wonderful to offer God our gifts as a token of thanksgiving. Let us make an offering to God. We give to restore life. We give to heal the broken relationships. We give as a step on the journey to renewed sharing. Use our gifts, God, to restore, heal, and renew us in faith with one another. Amen. Let us come together now in a time of prayer and of sharing concerns. I have two slips that have come forward this morning. The first from the Flansbergs for requesting prayer for Melody and Donna, who are both dealing with health concerns. We have another set of requests. Please pray for a friend, Diana's brother, Glenn, who passed away on Friday. I would say we should pray for the entire family as well. A second request, a prayer of thanks for Mary Ann, whose successful open heart surgery was on Friday. So let us remember to lift those folks up in our prayers this week. And as we do every week, I ask that you continue to pray for folks impacted by COVID, as well as all those who find themselves refugees, having lost their home base for no fault of their own. Let us take a moment now to lift up in prayer those names that we hold in our own hearts.
God of grace, we come before you today once again to worship you, to sing praises to you, to bring our prayers before you. We give thanks for all that you provide in our lives that keeps us warm and safe, keeps our stomachs full, for the communities that surround us, that show us love and care. We pray for those who have not been so blessed, for those who struggle with housing, with finding enough food for their families. Lord, we give you thanks for your grace that allows us to continue on even when we may have sinned, for your forgiveness and for the chance to always come back to you. Today, Lord, we also lift up all those Native American ministries that around our nation. So many folks seeking to bring your message to those who have not yet heard it, to improve the lives of those, whether they have or not, And Lord, we pray today that our eyes be opened to seeing your presence in each person we meet. May we be like those travelers to Emmaus whose eyes were eventually opened, who knew that they had been in touch with you. May our lives reflect your love and your grace to all around us so that others may see you in whatever we do. And Lord, today we end by saying once again those words that your son taught to his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you all to join in singing our closing hymn now, number 454, Open My Eyes. Thank <music>
May we go forth into the world seeking Christ and God's blessings in each person. And may we reflect that same to each and every person we meet. Let us go knowing that God has gone before us, that Christ shows us the way, and that the Holy Spirit is beside us each and every day. Amen.